احبائي المشاهدين رحب فيكم بحلقه جديده من برنامج بلا قيود ضيفي هذا الاسبوع هو الدكتور جوردن بيترسون اخصائي الطب النفسي واستاذ الطب النفسي في جامعه تورنتو بكندا ومؤلف الكتاب مابس اوف مينينجز او خرائط المعاني والكتاب الذي يصدر هذا الشهر في الاسواق 12 rules for life an antidote for chaos او 12 قاعده للحياه العلاج للفوضى Dr. Peterson, um, I welcome you to uh, Without Shackles, Bila Qiyud, and I thank you for the time that uh, you've given us today. Thanks for coming all the way up here. It seems like you have a bit of issue with the um, notion of happiness, and you say that people don't want happiness. What is it that people want or need, if not happiness? They, need, they want a life that's meaningful enough so that it justifies the suffering. And it's not the same thing. People think the goal of life is happiness, but if you live your life properly, that makes you resistant to tragedy and evil. It doesn't make you happy, it's, but that's much better. There's power in that. There's no power in happiness. It's too fleeting. And, and it isn't something that you can use as an antidote to the catastrophe of life. And you need an antidote to the catastrophe of life. It's not optional. Because if you don't have one, you end up in hell. That's what happens. And you can think about that psychologically and, and draw your own conclusions metaphysically. If you have no antidote to suffering, then you become something that just suffers stupidly. And no one can tolerate that without becoming corrupt. It's not possible. It's it, no more than if you took a dog and starved it in a corner and hit it with a stick randomly every day. You'd expect that dog to be like anything but brutal. You can't do that to yourself. And people need nobility of purpose. Happiness is so, it's so shallow as a goal. And that's, that's not to say you shouldn't welcome it, but it's something that comes in as a stranger and as a gift. You can't chase it. It isn't possible. Life isn't constituted that way. Is there a difference between happiness and joy? Well, I, I think you have... It would depend on how the words were contextualized. Like joy to me seems to be a deeper word in many ways because I think it's associated with a more profound... It, it occurs when more things have been profoundly set right. For example, if you listen to a remarkable piece of music, like a deep remarkable piece of music, you don't generally say that it makes you happy. You might say that it brought you joy. Joy is like happiness that's, that's maybe... It's like it's got a, it, it's leavened with a bit of tragedy. It's something like that. So there's something profound about it instead of something that's just, what do people do to be happy? They go to an amusement park, you know, and they spin around. It's, that's happiness. The things that make our life great aren't necessarily the things that make us happy. And happiness is fine, but it's more like a side effect. It's something that comes upon you when you're doing when you're fortunate, it's like a grace of God, in my estimation. It's not something to pursue. You pursue what's right. And if you're rewarded with happiness, well, then you should be grateful for that. Because it's rare and, and fleeting and unlikely. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't have contempt for it. But the idea that that's something you can pursue, I think, is naive beyond belief. What do you do when tragedy strikes then? Life is for happiness. Well, great. So now you have an illness. Well, now what are you going to do? You going to be happy about that? I don't think so. Or your child is struck down with an illness. You know, or these things happen to people all the time. That there's a catastrophe that emerges. And if happiness is the rationale for being, then as soon as you're unhappy, you have no rationale for being. Well, that's not very good because you're going to be unhappy. It's, it's built into the structure. Don't you think that people, when they talk about happiness or they seek happiness or they crave it, they are... They are seeking that depth of peace and security. I do think that, but the words that people use matter. Peace is much better. To seek peace, that's much better goal than to seek happiness. First of all, if you have peace, you might have happiness. Peace is much better. And that's a really good guiding principle with regards to trying to settle disputes in your family. So if you're having an argument with someone you love, victory isn't the right goal. Peace is the goal. And peace means, well, I'm listening to you. No matter how annoying you are, I'm kind of going to try to generate up a reciprocal arrangement that we can both really live by. That's peace. And then maybe you eat together 
in peace and then you're happy. That's, but there's no peace without truth. Mm. And there's, yeah, there's no peace without truth. And truth is bitter. So, because you, you learn things by is error. Is there security without truth? No. Well, I mean, imagine you're in a relationship and you both lie to each other all the time. There's no security in that relationship. You don't, it's not even a relationship. It doesn't even exist. It's just a tissue of lies. Neither of you live in the actual world. And as soon as anything comes along that's stressful, it'll just tear you to pieces. So, yeah, there's, there's no security when the world you live in is false. It'll fall apart at any moment and you know it and you're terrified by it. You'll sweat at night because of it. It's dreadful. So, terrible as the truth is, the falsehood is far worse. What does it hold a person together when you are struck with, uh, when life strikes you and you have a tremendous amount of pain inside of you? What holds you up together when you lose all that sense of happiness in your life to be able to go through? Well, well-established relationships with family, that can help support you. You know, that's the, that's the lesson of Noah's Ark, essentially, because Noah guided his family and mankind, for that matter, through the flood. And the reason he could do that was because he was perfect in his generations. That's the statement. And what it meant was that the person who can pilot the craft that carries the family and society through the flood is the person who's put their familial relationships together. So that can help. Productive activity, productive and meaningful activity is very much useful for people. I mean, sometimes you can become so ill that all of those things are compromised. None of these things are necessary um, medications against the ultimate tragedy. People die. And, but <clears throat> that doesn't mean there aren't better and worse solutions. And having people around, having an intimate relationship that's based on truth and that has a strong foundation and having a family that is aiming up and together and being ensconced in a community that you serve and that serves you back and to be aiming at higher things. All of those are part of a protective structure that keeps you afloat when things get rough. You have to have something to turn to that's meaningful. And I think even a good definition of meaning is something like, meaning is what serves as an antidote to malevolence and tragedy. It's something like that. Yeah, the problem is like people interpret the word meaning in a, a million ways that sometimes it's not even meaningful. To well, they're not them. pessimistic enough in some sense, and, and that means they're not realistic enough. People don't think about how frequently in the future their life will be punctuated by tragedy and catastrophe. And so they don't prepare themselves properly for that. And it's because they're afraid, well, and because they don't want to bear the responsibility. But that's, that's not wise, because first of all, you can open your eyes and bear the responsibility, and that works out a lot better for everyone, including you. Actually, that brings to mind uh, the word that you like <clears throat> always use is sacrifice. You mm -hmm. always emphasize on the value of sacrifice, and you, you see it as a kind of like it has a, some kind of redemptive power. Can, mm -hmm. can you talk Let go of what's in your way. So That's what, what sacrifice is sacrifice? Means. How do I know what do I, what do I need to sacrifice? Oh, you probably know that on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. I mean, one of the things you can do, and I suppose this is a function of something akin to prayer, you can get up in the morning and think, okay, I have to organize my day so that by the end of the day, I'm either slightly ahead or no, or no further behind. And perhaps I also want to have a day that, that is engaging and meaningful. Those are decent conditions. So you ask yourself, well, what do I have to do to make sure that that occurs? Well, if you ask a question properly, you will get the answer. Might not be the answer you want, but you can get an answer. Well, here's fourth, it's your conscience in some sense. You know, if you just sit now and you think, what have I been putting off that's going to get me in trouble? And you really want to know, you'll know instantly. Well, then you go and deal with those things. And what do you sacrifice? You sacrifice moment to moment impulsive pleasure to engage in difficult activities that will solve looming problems. And most of the time, you don't have to do that with all your time. 
But sometimes when you're in crisis, you do. That's, your life is nothing but that. It's nothing but staving off additional rising water. Well, but there's advantages, there's certainly advantages to facing that forthrightly. The psychological literature is clear on that. If you run from something that intimidates and frightens you, it gets bigger and you get smaller. If you turn around and face it, well, now and then that's fatal. But most of the time, that makes you bigger and it's smaller. And so, and the sacrifice is the willingness to let go of what's impulsively attractive now so that things are better in the longer terms and for more people, right? So it's a cold virtue in some sense. And it, it isn't associated obviously with happiness, it's more associated with something like conscientiousness because it means, you know, if you act in the moment so that you're bearing the responsibility for the future, that's a heavy load. It's hard to be happy under those circumstances. Generally, people want to forget about their problems and forget about the future when they want to be happy. But if you take on the load of the future in the present, at least in measured doses, then you can ensure that the suffering that will manifest itself in the future is minimized. And that's definitely worthwhile at every possible level. of The unnecessary suffering is minimized at every level of analysis. There's, that's almost self-evidently a worthwhile uh, pathway. Listening to all of that uh, makes me think to a certain degree that we kind of like need a different species for to be able to tolerate all of that, like to, to have the real human being come out of all of this ambiguity that we all live in as, as if like, I have to always be aware. I have to be accountable to every thought. I have to really observe myself all the time to know who I am. I have, I have to make a conscious decision to be honest to me and to others. And mm, all it's of, unbearable load. It's unbearable yeah, load. That, that's a good, it's that's it's a, a huge good responsibility. Well, one of the th reasons that Jung thought that Catholicism was preferable in some of its aspects to Protestantism was because Catholicism actually decreased that load. Because you could go confess and rid yourself of your unbearable sins. And you could promise to do better and that was sufficient. So it suffices to move forward. You, do, you don't have to be perfect. Or maybe the perfection is found in the willingness to move forward, something like that. Because you're, you, know, you are fundamentally ignorant and flawed with a proclivity for malevolence, right? It's built into human character. And so it isn't self-evident that you can transcend that in any absolute sense, but you can certainly move in that direction incrementally. And I would also say that part of the process of doing that is to treat yourself with a certain amount of, I hate to use the word love, but it's the only word that suffices. You know, if you're trying to encourage a child, you don't put on them a burden that they cannot even hypothetically bear. You put on them a load that they have a high probability of carrying successfully. And then they're stronger and then they're successful. And you can do the same thing with yourself. It's like you want to set the goals for movement forward into the future so that they're difficult but attainable. And that way you're not being too punitive, too perfectionistic, let's say, with regards to yourself. So you have to have... Your objection is basically... If people aren't perfect, they, they're, they're worthy of punishment. It's a justice argument. And there's truth in that. But the thing about that is that the justice has to be tempered with mercy. It's like, well, yes, people should act properly, but we don't. And so everyone can't be, you know, sent to Hades instantly because of that. So it's, it's ambition tempered with mercy for, on everyone's part. It's like we move forward as fallible creatures, as individuals and as groups. And we have to realize that even about our, ourselves. So Jung said, for example, that you had to forgive the sinner that is yourself. And so that's a very wise, he didn't mean stop aiming up. He meant don't beat yourself to death when you fail as you inevitably will. And that's, that's good. And it is, I think it is reasonable to think about it the same way that you think about how you would treat a child that you actually care for. You know, if they make a mistake, you lay out the error and, and 
put into practice reasonable consequences, but you want the child to get back up and get at it again, so you don't punish them so severely that there's nothing left to move forward into the future. It's minimal necessary force. I would follow with this um, question that, um, personally, I, it, 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 um, it boggles my mind. Are we as human beings capable of this level of consciousness? To get to that level of like knowing who we are, cat, understanding who we are, you know, uh, tolerating the pain to change who we are, and being all the time in that place of consciousness. Well, that's the central question of being fundamentally is like, is there a manner in which we can make our being tolerable or being itself tolerable? That is the central question. We're self conscious and we're always aware of the tragic and malevolent preconditions for being. So what do we do about that? That's the fundamental religious question. Well, the Christian answer is accept your tragedy and thereby transcend it. That's a, I don't know of a better answer than that. That's, that's a hell of an answer. And the thing that's interesting about that answer is it's very much in keeping with what we know clinically is that when people accept their fears, when they face their fears, when they confront their disgust, when they, when they confront what broke them in the past, when they do it voluntarily, that that seems to be curative. It's powerfully curative. And we don't know the limits to that. Um, it's not like life is set up so that it doesn't demand everything you've got. It does. That's how it is. And you can do it well or badly. It's going to roll over you either way. So you might as well try to do it well. That's how it looks to me. And you could say, and, and with some justification, well, that's just too much. Um, in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, he has Christ come back to earth. It's the story of the Grand Inquisitor. And uh, Christ shows up in Seville in, in Spain and starts healing the sick and making the blind see and just acting in a miraculous manner. And, the Inquisitor immediately has him imprisoned and thrown in a dungeon and sentences him to death the next day. And he says, look, one of you was enough. We don't need you back again. You put the burden on people that was too much for them to bear. And as worthy representatives of the church, we tried to tone that down over centuries so that the average person could tolerate it. Now you've come back to be this terrifying, great example. It's like, we're not letting you get away with that. It's a very powerful argument. And I mean, the story closes very interestingly because Christ sits and listens to the old inquisitor raking him over the coals. And then when he's done his speech, he kisses him on the lips and the inquisitor turns white and leaves. And, but when he leaves, he leaves the door open. It's a brilliant story because it's trying to address the issue that you brought up, which is, well, what's the demand for all this perfection? And, the Inquisitor says, well, we have to tone it down. It's too much for people to bear. For a second, you were um, hesitant of using the word love. You said, I hate this word. So do you care to explain like? It's, it's, there's words that have been damaged irreparably from overuse. And that's one of them. It, it, you have to be very careful when you say that, because first of all, you sound sanctimonious when you say it, and that's not good. And second, you have to be very careful that you actually mean it. And generally people don't when they say it because it's very difficult to mean. You know, I could say, well, you should be in love with being. It's like, well, which part? How about the Armenian genocide? You want to be in love with that? Or, or, or the hundred million deaths that communism caused in the 20th century or the, or, the, or the hundreds of millions of people who are still starving to death today. We are in love with that. It's not an easy thing to ask for. And you can say, well, you love someone else. Maybe you do. You're pretty aware of their inadequacies as far as you're concerned, the way they don't live up to your expectations, all their flaws. And then when it comes to yourself, it's even worse because you know who you are. It's no easy. Th See, love is an act of courage, just like trust. If you're not naive, you trust someone and you're naive, it's because you're naive. You don't know that you can be hurt. You think everyone's good. Once you know that that's not the case, then it's easy to become cynical. And But beyond cynicism is the trust that relies on courage. You say, oh, I know that I can be hurt, but I'll put out my hand to someone else anyways, because that way I can call forth, 
forth the best that's within them and me. It's courage, and love is like that too. To love being is an act of courage. And, and that isn't generally how it's used. It's used like in a hippie sort of flower child, naive, everything is wonderful, new age way, and that's just not going anywhere. No one think, no one believes in their heart of hearts that that's even the least bit true. If I can ask you, then what it is behind that word or concept or world of love that people are after, that it's so used, so mis misused, so, mis so, so abused, like this well, it is word. What, it is what they want. It is what people want. To love someone is to want the best for them and to work for that. And if you're around someone who's doing that for you, then it's wonderful. I mean, it is something that's genuinely life-affirming. It's something that good parents do for their children. They encourage them, right? They think, I want the best for you. And I suppose that's about as close as you really get to the more perfect forms of love in a person's typical life. You see that with mothers, very commonly with mothers and their, and their infants. And so that's what, part of the reason that the mother with the infant is a sacred image, because there is something about that love that is all well, let's say all good. It's all, it's all directed towards affirming the life of this creature who's coming into being. Well, that, that's, something to, that's something to strive for in your relationships in general, to interact with someone in a manner that would allow the best to manifest itself for them. But then you have to be in love with being, and you have to conquer your resentment and your jealousy and all, all of those things, and, and your desire for the other person to fail so that you're elevated, and, and your desire to see people hurt just because you're angry about everything. And that's an incredibly common sentiment. I mean, people dispense arrows and darts nonstop because they're so dissatisfied and angry with the conditions of their own life. So, and it's very difficult to overcome that because Generally speaking, people who are bitter have something to be bitter about. You know, they've been horribly abused, or they're ill, or, or their dreams have been shattered, or they've been betrayed. I mean, even with depression, what you see from an epidemiological perspective is that the vast majority of people who develop major depressive disorder have something really terrible happen to them, and then the depressive disorder manifests itself in the aftermath of that. So, and your question is perfectly reasonable. Is, is the, are the conditions of life so intolerable that asking for moral virtue from human beings is, is asking too much? That's a great question. But the answer from my perspective is the alternative is worse because all that the, the consequence of immoral action is that everything that makes life hellish multiplies out of control and nothing good exists at all. And that just doesn't seem like a good solution. It seems to me like um, when people like use the word love or go after love or crave this feeling, they're going after being united to each other. But what we so far have accomplished is, is that exterior unity, that just physical, whether it's between like, um, parents and children, whether it's between husband and wife, you know, uh, friends, it's no matter what we do, we are at the exterior and this interior of us is still separated. We're not able to connect. No, it's very hard to build a unity because people's, well, pe because it's technically difficult, but because people differ and then because people are full of snakes, all of those things, it's very difficult to build a unity. What do you but mean full of snakes? Well, if you're negotiating with someone towards a positive end, then negotiation can only work if they're all in for the positive end. But people are often not like that. Like even in a marriage, it isn't, it isn't simple. It is no simple matter to act in the best interests of your, yourself or your partner. To truly do that, you have to first of all determine what those best interests are, and then you have to be willing to put aside everything that makes you angry about life, and then, and then you have to pay attention, and you have to both communicate that, and you have to build something that works across time. 
and it, it is possible. I mean, and we, you know, I, I don't want to be entirely pessimistic about people. In functional societies, and there are some functional societies, the Western democracies are, I would say, reasonably functional. People do cobble together pretty workable arrangements. You know, most, mostly you can trust other people in a Western society. The default is trust, and mostly that works. You walk into a store, they're probably not going to rip you off. The tax people, although they're hard on you, they don't cheat. The police, by and by, aren't corrupt. They don't expect a bribe every time, they, every time you're stopped. And the fact that we have... So, I, so that's all evidence that it is possible to produce large-scale functional societies that are predicated on truth and that that actually works, even though it's extraordinarily difficult. It is possible to do that. And it is possible to make them better, I think. I mean, over the last year, since some of the things I've been talking about have become widely distributed, particularly the issue, say, we'll talk particularly about the issue associated with not lying. I've had hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people now write and tell me they've experimented with not lying and that their lives have overwhelmingly changed for the better. And so there are things that people can do that are within our power. Like it is within our power not to lie. Right. Or at least to lie less. You know, and it makes we, us feel better even when we don't, when we choose well, not to it, lie. Well, it, it doesn't take long for it to feel better. You, you have more respect for yourself, but you're also acting out a kind of covenant with being. And the idea is, why tell the truth? Well, let's consider the truth a reflection of reality. Well, you wouldn't want to reflect reality if it was evil. You'd lie all the time if reality was evil. Well, so if you're going to tell the truth, then you've made a decision to trust the possibility that reality might be good. Well, it says, when God creates the cosmos in Genesis, after each of the days, he says that what he did was good. And so there's this emphasis that reality as such is fundamentally good. Now, that's a hard, bitter pill to swallow, given all the things that seem to be wrong with it. Death, for example, and betrayal, and all those terrible things. So, but to decide to put yourself in parallel, in harmony with being, which is the same as telling the truth, means to accept the possibility that being might be good. Well, we hope that that's the case. But the empirical evidence, well, the anecdotal evidence, let's say, is that, and I would say the empirical evidence as well, that the truth is much more effective means of dealing with reality than falsehood. And how could it be any other way, if you think about it? I mean, What do you consider to be um, normal mental health? Well, Freud said it was the capacity to work and love. That's pretty good for a one-line summary. You know, you should be engage in something that's meaningful and productive. So it's meaningful and that takes care of you in some sense, and it's productive and that takes care of others. And then to establish, to be able to establish intimate relationships with other people in, in your, you know, in your primary relationship and, and in your family, if you can manage those two things, that's, that's pretty good. If you go beyond normative health, say, and you look for something like the ideal, I think the ideal is that you have an ideal first, that you have an active, articulated ideal that you're genuinely pursuing. It's thoroughly thought through and you're committed to it. And that should be something like reduce unnecessary suffering or work and act in such a manner that things around you improve. It should be something like that. And, and, then, and then manifest that commitment in your, in your, in your actions day to day and week to week. That's that's something that's more closely approximating an ideal. I've enjoyed so much uh, talking to you, and I'm sure my audience have enjoyed so much listening. They have uh, learned so much today, and they have so much work ahead of them to do after listening to all these um, valuable thoughts and, and advice on how to go about life. I thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Peterson, for this thank, time. Well, thank you for coming up here and taking all the time and putting all this effort into it. So it's my pleasure. أحبائي المشاهدين حلقتنا لليوم انتهت على أمل لقاء جديد بترككم مع بركة الرب يسوع.